Okay. Okay. Um, so we're very lucky to have one of your Hoffman's speaking today. Um, but is visiting from the Max Planck Institute in um, um, And before that, um, she was a Miller Fellow at Berkeley um, after doing her PhD at Cambridge. Long time ago, yes. Okay, and today she's going to be talking about um, gas secretion and star formation in galaxies. Okay. okay. So thank you for inviting me. I guess probably a lot of you were, might have been uh, expecting a talk on um, uh, galaxy properties with SDSS, which is something I've been working on for a long time, um, but I decided it's uh, time for a bit of a change, and it's always more fun to talk about what you haven't done already, or you're hoping to do, than what you've done already. So, um, so the title of my talk is uh, Gas Accretion and Star Formation in Galaxies, and why we really need to understand the gas in detail, and particularly observe the gas, in order to understand galaxy formation. And um, I think theoreticians, you know, um, understand that point, but um, observationally, the gas is way behind the stars, and so the, I'm going to tell you about some attempts to try and um, get things on par, because I think it's one of these, uh, th these problems that we've been facing in trying to put things together. So um, as I told you, this is a work that's just really getting off the ground in the last year or so. It's a collaboration that's uh, still taking shape. Um, we started to do uh, surveys of the atomic gas uh, using the Arecibo telescope, uh, which I'll be talking about, and I've been working uh, with, uh, in particular with David Sheminovich over in Colombia. He's the PI of, of the gas survey, and Barbara Casanella is a postdoc at, at MPA. And we also started uh, to do something systematic uh, with observing molecular gas in galaxies <coughs> using the IRAM 30 meter telescope at Pico Valletta in Spain, and that's a collaboration with people, uh, particularly at the MPE, uh, Linda Tacconi, Emily Santonge, and also uh, Karsten Kramer uh, at the IRAM Observatory. And then we want to do, of course, the stars at the same time, and uh, for this particular survey, the, uh, the SDSS spectroscopy turns out to be not quite good enough, so we uh, also have now a program of MMT spectroscopy, um, as well uh, involving uh, uh, Tim Heckman, Sean Moran at Johns Hopkins, and I'll also be talking about um, some new semi-analytic modeling as well with PhD students at MPA. So a lot of these things still uh, in processes of development, so this is more sort of a, sort of a progress report than um, a report on stuff that's still in progress. So some motivations. So in terms of understanding galaxies, I think um, we've learned a lot about characterizing uh, how the stellar populations and the stellar masses and star formation rates of galaxies evolve with redshift, but I think we're very far from understanding some um, very basic questions. In particular, what physical processes set the characteristic mass scales of galaxies today? We know that the dark matter halo mass function has a characteristic shape which is quite different from that of the galaxy mass function. So somehow the baryons, uh, the condensation of baryons into galaxies has to, uh, has to be driven by processes which uh, change your basic power law behavior here to something which is uh, much like a Schechter function. And the other thing I think we know now, but we still don't understand in detail, is why exactly are there these two clearly distinct galaxy populations, the red sequence galaxies and the blue sequence galaxies, which are, are clearly separate and distinct. We see these, these very clear bimodal distributions now, both in the local universe and at high redshifts. So one can build galaxy formation models that follow you know, a whole host of complicated processes cooling, star formation, feedback, and supernova, uh, and also AGN. And um, these models t do do a uh, reasonable job at, at uh, reproducing some of these basic statistical quantities. So for the combination of strong supernova feedback to suppress uh, star formation in low mass galaxies and AGN feedback to stop gas from cooling in the high mass halos, um, one can get matches to the luminosity 
function and the mass functions and so on. But we still have to ask ourselves, is that sufficient proof? You know, do we know that, that these solutions are actually correct? So we know that galaxy formation is obviously a fairly fine balance between processes, form what I would call formation or accretion processes, and also pro that act to, you know, to form the galaxies and also uh, processes which act to shut down galaxies. So in terms of formation, theory tells us that gas accretion um, occurs in, in, in two possible main modes in the universe. The one is um, occurring mainly in the lower mass halos uh, where the cooling times of the gas are short compared to the dynamical times and the gas comes in uh, already relatively cold in the form of, of, of filaments. This is the famous uh, picture by, by Dusan Karras um, showing this uh, at work in simulations. And then in more massive halos, the gas is able to shock and heat up and, and, and uh, be in very equilibrium uh, with the dark matter in these, in these large halos and cool in a more sort of quasi-static spherical configuration that's now known as the hot mode of accretion. And so uh, opposed to these formation processes, there are uh, numerous quenching processes. Um, one of them is supernova, um, which go off whenever stars are formed and can act to eject metals and decrease the efficiency of star formation, particularly in low-mass galaxies. Um, AGN feedback, still mainly a theoretical concept, uh, may quench star formation in massive galaxies. Gas may be stripped in clusters. Um, so I think you get the idea that formation and quenching processes all apply to the gas. But observational astronomers who study galaxy evolution, and particularly galaxy evolution at high redshifts, have focused almost exclusively on the cosmic evolution of stars, looking at either the stellar mass or the star for evolution of star formation rate density uh, with redshifts. So we have a lot of information on that um, from these high redshift surveys. We, have, we know about the evolution of the stellar mass function with cosmic look back time, the fact that there's little evolution at the high mass end, but the low mass end there seems to show um, significantly faster evolution, the famous um, downsizing. Um, we can characterize now the evolution of stellar mass contained in red and blue galaxy populations as a function of redshift. We can look at how star formation in a blue sequence uh, has evolved. Um, we look back time, the fact that there's still relatively narrow sequences of star forming galaxies, but the amplitude of star formation has gone up. Um, and the high redshift observers frequently attempt to interpret uh, their results in terms of sort of flow diagrams. Uh, you often see these in their talks that uh, they, 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 they draw flow diagrams through these, uh, through these diagrams, which all have to do with accretion and quenching processes. But again, uh, these, uh, in, these uh, arguments are all very indirect. So I will argue that what is really needed to make progress now is to uh, not only study the stars and galaxies as a function of look-back time, but also to understand in more detail this star-gas cycling in galaxies. And this is what we're trying to do with these, with these surveys of, uh, of cold gas and galaxies. So in terms of the stars um, in the low redshift universe, which will be the focus of my talk, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, as you know, has sort of revolutionized the study of the stellar components of nearby galaxies by obtaining uh, imaging in, in, in five photometric passbands of, of millions of galaxies and also a high signal-to-noise spectra over a large wavelength range with a, you know, um, good resolution, good signal-to-noise. So you have a lot, of, a lot of information about characterizing stellar populations of galaxies, um, star formation rates, metallicities, and so on. Um, the H1 community uh, has an ongoing tradition of uh, large area blind surveys. Uh, they've been traditionally been motivated by the search for the so-called dark galaxies. So we always have this problem in CDM about uh, uh, the faint end of the uh, mass function um, um, being flatter than what people thought. So people thought that maybe some of the galaxies could be be hiding in the form of, of H1 uh, that didn't manage to form stars. So this motivated a lot of uh, blind searches, just trying to select 
in H1 with, with, uh, irrespective of stars. And the most advanced of these, the latest in the series, is the so-called alfalfa survey, or alpha-alpha survey, which is being carried out by the Arecibo, at the Arecibo telescope and led by um, Martha Haynes and uh, Riccardo Giovanelli in Cornell. So just to give you an idea of the state of the art in these blind H1 surveys, um, the, the previous biggest uh, blind survey was the High Pass survey carried out the Parkes Telescope in, in Australia, surveyed 30,000 square degrees of sky, detected 4,300 galaxies. Um, alfalfa is significantly deeper. It goes over a smaller area. It goes over 7,000 square degrees of sky and is uh, expected to detect more than 25,000 galaxies. So it's an order of magnitude more sensitive and high pass has better angular resolution, less confusion, uh, better spectral resolution, and so on. And, you know, you can make maps like this with alfalfa, and you start to get, you know, you know impressively large numbers of, of objects by H1 standards, but they still nevertheless constitute a very biased subset of optically selected galaxies. What you are mainly picking up is uh, uh, low-mass galaxies, which tend to be the ones with the, with the highest H1 content, and uh, so, at, particularly at, at masses of L star and so on, uh, where the, the, the gas con typical gas fractions of galaxies drop to about 10%, which is like far Milky Way, you get, you get a rather biased view of the universe with these blind surveys. So it's for this reason we decided to um, undertake a, a deeper um, a survey on top of alfalfa, and the survey is called GAS, and GAS stands for the Galax Arecibo SDSS survey. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that we wanted to get complete H1 information down to small uh, gas fractions for an unbiased sample of galaxies selected only according to their stellar mass. So um, this gas survey it was a targeted H1 survey. It did not do blind searching of the sky. It knows that we, we can find galaxies using Sloan. So these are 1,000 galaxies selected in the redshift range point 0.025 to 0.05 with stellar masses greater than 10 to the 10 solar masses. So we're looking at galaxies just below the Milky Way mass and above. And observed until they're detected or until we reach a uniform gas mass fraction limit of 1.5%. So the idea is that we want to characterize the gas that still has the potential to form stars and influence the subsequent history of the galaxy. So this is a large program involving about 1,000 hours of, uh, of observing time. It started last year. Um, we had struggles with it in order to, to get them to give the time they um, promised to us, but uh, it's now going reasonably well. We have an observing team, and we go out to Puerto Rico and make use of this uh, ancient telescope, which is still useful for some things. Um, and uh, so this is the sort of data that we get. We, we target galaxies for which we have uh, a nice image from Sloan. This is one, one arc minute. Um, we have the optical spectrum, but remember that the Sloan uh, fiber only subtends uh, three arc seconds. So it really, at these redshifts that we, where we can detect the gas, the Sloan fiber is only telling you about the, the stellar populations of the very innermost region of the galaxies. That's why we have to get the long slit spectroscopy that I'll talk about later. And uh, so, and then on top of that, we have this is single dish H1 observations. Um, the beam size of Arecibo is four arc minutes, so we don't know what the spatial distribution of the gas is. What we get from these observations is basically redshift, a rotational velocity from the line width, and an H1 flux, which is the H1 mass. So, with uh, about 25 to 30 percent of the sample in hand. Um, we're able to do the most simple, basic, boring thing, which nevertheless is very important, and that is to understand what, is the, what are the scaling relations between H1 mass fraction and galaxy properties. How does that depend? What is the typical H1 uh, mass of, of, of galaxies in the local universe? Because we have to understand what typical is in order to understand which are the ga gas-rich ones, which are the ones that may be doing interesting things. So this is uh, what gas fraction, the H1, divided by stellar mass does as a function of mass. Of course, it decreases. It decreases as a function of 
the surface density of the galaxy, which is the mass divided by uh, the area contained within the half, uh, the mass contained within the half-light radius. And this is the concentration index, which is like a bulge disk ratio. And this is a, a measure of its color from the UV to optical ratios. So the two strongest drivers of the H1 uh, fraction are the color, in fact, and the uh, surface mass density, or, or the size of the galaxy. There's rather little relation with, with the bulge disk ratio in terms of the H1 fraction. So you can actually show with this data that there, if you want to predict empirically uh, the H1 gas fraction, um, this combination of NUV minus R color and mu star gives you the best uh, predictor. So you can actually define a plane uh, which is, uh, gives us the smallest dispersion for predicting H1 over M star. So, bluer galaxies have more H1, and the more massive galaxies have more H1? Is that the way to understand it? So, this is all scaled to the stellar mass. Yes, yes they do have more H1, but in relative terms, they have less H1. Less H1. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So, so, for the bluer guys, have more H1, right? In relative terms, yes. So, the blue galaxies is all in terms of the H1 mass divided by the stellar mass. Okay, so why do, we want to, why do we want to define this plane? And I'll show you why it's interesting to know this plane. It's because uh, once we know what the equilibrium galaxy, how it's defined in terms of its gas content, then we have a good way of defining galaxies which lie, which are, lie uh, away from these galaxies. So for example, we can look at galaxies which are red, um, concentrated, um, in other words, they're elliptical-like galaxies, yet have higher uh, than normal H1 content. Um, likewise, we can define galaxies which are blue, um, low surface density, but have lower than average H1 content. And I would argue that the, this is a good uh, way of picking out what we would call transition objects, objects which are on the way of, of, of either transitioning uh, to and from uh, the blue to the red sequence. So I'll be talking about that um, in more detail. But first let me just say something about the molecular gas because the H1, of course, is not the only cold phase of the interstellar medium. And in particular, it's not the phase from which stars are forming. So by surveying only atomic gas, you are missing uh, another important component of, of, of the cold interstellar medium. So um, we are, uh, this is, this is a lar another large program which recently got through the telescopes. This is one that is behind the H1 programs. I don't have results to show you, but the, uh, the idea behind this cold gas survey on IRAM is very similar, that we will take galaxies which are being observed uh, by Arecibo and we'll observe them until we uh, go to a fixed uh, limit in, in molecular gas mass fraction with standard conversion factor. Um, again, of one and a half percent, irrespective of any other selection, uh, atomic gas or, or any other property. O only, we only d define the limit in terms of, of H2 over M stars. So this is being done in collaboration with the MPE group. And um, if you thought that the situation for atomic gas, uh, understanding atomic gas was bad, you should just go and see what it's like for the, mo the molecular gas. So, I mean, um, I, I think systematic surveys of molecular gas in nearby galaxies kind of ended with Judy Young um, sometime in, in, I think, in the 1990s. Um, and there, there have been sort of uh, very, very heterogeneous data sets. And you can try your best. You can say, well, I don't have to go out and get more data. It's local data. Um, and you can go out and, and put all these data sets together, match them to Sloan, and, um, and take them at face value. But then you, you end up with really horrible looking things. For example, here is this exercise that Cheng Li did that, that actually matched the literature, uh, most of the literature uh, CO measurements that we could find, assume, try to make them all uniform in terms of cosmology and, and conversion factor. And here's a plot of H2 mass fraction as a function of M star. And you get huge dispersion, you know, almost uh, uh, two orders of magnitude on the y-axis. And this is very hard to understand. In fact, I'll, I'll come to that later. And you would say, do I really believe the data? 
And after looking at it, we think that we actually don't. There are lots of reasons. There, there are problems with aperture. There are problems with bad signal noise detections. It was just not done very uniformly. Um, and this, the fact that this is spurious uh, seems to be borne out with some of the recent data that we're getting much smaller uh, dispersions in, in which are much more understandable. OK. So the technology has now advanced that with the IRAM 30 meter telescope, we had this from our pilot survey uh, we've carried out this summer, that, that we can get very good detections of Sloan galaxies uh, pretty quickly in, in less than an hour. So surveys do become feasible. OK. But I don't, that, that just got underway. We had our first observing uh, campaign in, in December, and there's another one in March. Um, so I don't yet have results, observational results to show you, but I can talk about some theoretical work that we're doing to try and predict uh, what we should see. So this is actually work which is uh, based on semi-analytic models, uh, which are run on top of the Millennium Run. Um, so this is being carried out by uh, students at the MPA and Mark Krumholtz, who's at uh, UCSC. So, um, so from the Millennium Run, as you probably most of you know, um, we can construct these merging history trees that follow how uh, the dark matter halos and subhalos uh, merge as a function of time, and this, this uses our skeleton for our galaxy formation models, um, on which we uh, we we build uh, sort of we include simple processes to describe gas cooling, star formation, uh, and feedback. So that's fairly well established. Um, what we've done that's new here is to build some uh, radially resolved models for galactic disk formations, very, very simple ones. Um, so what we do is we track the radial distribution of the gas, which is accreted at each output time. Um, we just assume that the scale radius of the infalling gas, which we get from the simulation directly, is simply proportional to uh, the spin parameter, which we can, make, can measure from the simulation, times the virial radius of the halo, um, modulo some factors. This is following basic arguments that, that the gas will collapse, conserving angular momentum until it becomes rotationally supported um, by full of statue of Mo, Mao, and White, and so on. So, so uh, as a function of time, this uh, shows you uh, what that, inf the, the radial distribution of the infalling gas. So the red is uh, at, at early cosmic times, and the blue is at late cosmic times. So you start off with really uh, low mass halos at high redshift. They're very compact configurations. Then as, as the uh, dark matter halos grow as a function of time, then the, uh, the, the, the characteristic RD uh, increases. You also get more gas accretion. Um, this shows the cumulative radial distribution of the, of the accreted gas. So this is just the cumulative version of this. And then this is what happens when you, after you put star formation and supernova feedback on top of the gas. So we simply, uh, the gas that falls in what one snapshot is simply superposed on the gas that has already fallen at earlier times. We don't consider radial migrations uh, within the disk in this, in this version. And then to predict the... Yes, so um, this analysis is meant to be for uh, disk galaxies that don't occur, that don't undergo very many mergers. We, have a, we, we, we don't try and, and uh, predict what happens to the gas when, when it's hit by, in a merger in, in any detail. What we've done right now is, is to restrict the analysis to disk-dominated galaxies. And when, when we do track mergers, but we simply just add the disk the gas from the, um, the satellites on, onto, the, uh, onto the main galaxy in the simplest way. OK. So the, um, so the prescription for, we've used two prescriptions for turning the atomic gas into molecular gas. One is from these recent analytic models that Mark Krumholtz has developed in um, collaboration with Chris McKee and Tomlinson. Um, these are very simple treatment uh, of the, the case of, of spherical clouds, which are uh, immersed in a, in a surrounding uh, radiation field. Um, and then he actually compute, computes the chemistry of, uh, of, 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 of the formation of molecules on dust grains. 
um, and actually predicts where inside the cloud you transition from the atomic uh, to the molecular gas and then uh, applies that, uh, these, these simplified models to, to the case of of, of, uh, of, of galactic disks where the atomic and molecular gas and pressure <coughs> equilibrium. So he's able to show in the sort of simplified analytic approach that there are two main parameters which uh, set the balance between atomic and molecular gas in his models. Um, that is the primary driver is the surface density of uh, the total surface density of the gas in the disk and is a secondary dependence on, on metallicity. So um, as when metallicity um, is low, then actually you have to be at higher, uh, you have less dust, of course, and you have to go to higher column densities to reach a given molecular fraction. So this is, this is actually somewhat theoretically motivated prescription. There is another one that uh, it's been floating around in literature by Blitz and Rozolowski. Uh, also, Elmer Green had something similar. That is not based on any uh, ab initio theoretical type computations that is purely empirical uh, formulation that they actually propose that the H2 fraction is simply a function of the uh, kinetic pressure of the, of the interstellar medium, um, in which case it should depend on uh, both the gas and the stellar uh, surface densities in the galaxy modulo some treatment of, of scale heights and, and so on, which you can put in some, some scalings for. Um, so we tried both of these in our models, in fact. So um, what we've done is to, uh, to look first at whether the models uh, can be consistent with uh, the detailed data we now have from uh, Things and Heracles that, that uh, Leroy and Begil produced uh, as part of their observational work when they actually got detailed gas, uh, H1 and molecular gas and stellar maps of, of, of about uh, a dozen or so nearby spiral galaxies. And um, we find that modulo, some complications to do with the actual star formation law. Um, we do do a reasonable job in the models of, of reproducing these profiles. Um, one of the complications is that uh, we cannot have a star formulation law in which stars only form if molecular gas forms. Uh, that actually leads to too much atomic gas being collected in the outer parts of, of galaxies. That, in fact, if you look at the observational data, they do find that, that star formation does still go on in the outer, atomic, uh, outer regions of the disk where, where the atomic gas um, dominates over the molecular gas, uh, but there's a steeper dependence. Uh, so we actually have to put in uh, a sort of a, a hybrid star formation law where, the, where you do have a linear dependence on, on the H2 surface density where the molecular gas dominates and something which is proportional to the, uh, the surface density of the total gas squared in the, um, in the, in the uh, um, atomic gas dominated regime. The other problem we have is that... Uh, how, how does sigma H2 go with sigma gas in the region with The so sigma H2 uh, comes out of these, yeah. Okay, so the, the, the second problem uh, we have to address in these models is uh, the fact that um, the gas consumption times, so what, what you see in nearby uh, galactic disks is that the surface density of the H2 and the surface density of the stars actually track each other remarkably well. They actually almost have very similar profiles. And that's kind of difficult to understand because this is basically the surface density of all the, uh, the whole history of star formation integrated from high redshift to the present day, whereas this is the material from which uh, gas is forming now. And you, in, in, our, in our scheme where the disks build up from the inside out uh, at late times, um, there's not that much material, which is actually coming into the center that would build up. Uh, so most of the material is actually distributed over large scale lengths. And so that leads to a problem that, um, that, the, that the molecular gas in the inner disks will be actually consumed and you, you get these holes in the inner disks uh, that you don't see in, in real life. So one 
possibility, which I think probably is the right solution, which we un unfortunately haven't yet included in the models, is that there really are radial inflows of gas which bring material from the outside to the inside and, and basically replenish the gas that has been used up. Um, uh, but that has to be included in the models in more detail. Another possibility is that energy from supernova is more efficiently dissipated in the dense inner regions of the disk. So remember, the gas supply is controlled not only by, by, by the infall and the star formation rates, but also by the reheating rates. Um, if, for some reason, that the dissipation or the cooling was, was, was larger in the inner regions of the disk, then um, one can also uh, keep more gas in the insides of the galaxies. Your models don't show no, so these models actually do not include radial inflow of the gas. We have models which show the hole. I haven't showed you in, this, in our paper, we, we have them. So um, what we had to do to fix the problem with the hole is to, we actually had to change the supernova um, feedback uh, to compensate. So, so I, I'm, not, I'm not defending that as being the... No, uh, I'm just trying to understand. So if I, if I have gas falling and for inner 10 kiloparsecs, it has to be fall, it falls Right. All right. And then basically it sits there for how we may go on that over time the gas basically gets consumed into making the stars. Right. And so you make the argument that that should lead to an inner hole. But uh, well, you, not, not in fact a hole, but a, a, a much flatter a much profile. Flatter. profile. You don't yeah. see that in flat profile. We, we do. I have another plot which shows it. So I, I unfortunately skipped. I should have I included so, that so plot. So in this plot, you basically said In this plot, we fixed it. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I can show you the paper where we, what happens if you don't. Well, we have a, um, okay. So once we fixed it, and I agree that it's a fudge right now, um, we can get models that produce a reasonable match to uh, observed mass functions of H1, H2, and stars in the local universe. Um, so this is the, um, this is the H1 mass function compared to the data from Zwan. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the H2 mass function. I would say that there isn't a good determination in the local universe. This is, again, made from incomplete surveys. Um, nevertheless, people went ahead and tried to, to, um, to evaluate it. So this is the uh, result from Keresh et al., uh, assuming a constant uh, H conversion factor from CO to H2. This is a result from Abreshko using the same data where he assumed a, uh, a conversion factor which depended on the B-band magnitude of the galaxy. Again, not very interestingly, our data agrees a little bit better with Keresh. I wouldn't um, say that's proof of anything. And this is the stellar mass function. Okay, so one, once we have these, these models that fit, um, Galax the galaxy profiles in, in halos of 200 kilometers a second or so, it's interesting to also compare, consider ensemble properties of disk galaxies and, and predict the sort of scaling relations that we're going to get in the data. So the relation between um, H1 mass fraction H2 over M star and also the uh, molecular to atomic ratio as a function of galaxy properties such as stellar mass, surface density, surface density of gas, and so these green points are, are, are what our models are giving, and these red points are, again, the integrated measurements from the same um, things, uh, Heracles data. So this is what we, we, what's publicly available right now. So um, at least the order of magnitude of the, sor the sort of um, the, the models and the data are lying in the right uh, areas right now. And we can ask, you know, what are, so what is actually setting these, these scatter plots? What are the the main physical drivers of, of these scaling relations. So, of course, one of them is, is the mass of the dark matter halo, which determines the mass of the baryons that is able to cool. And also, we know that because supernova feedback is less efficient in massive halos, a larger the larger fraction of the baryons that cool are, are actually converted into stars. So, so what you see here is that so these are these relations which have been coded according to the mass of the halo. So what you find is that uh, um, Basically, the more massive galaxies are forming, the more massive halos, and these also have the lower gas fractions. I might miss yeah. something, but in your models, you basically assume that smooth accretion is sort of responsible for the build up of these um, gaseous mass and, and, and galaxies. But then, sort of, 
you basically sort of derived in some um, stellar mass functions, and they agree with the simulation of the carriage at all that have sort of um, proposed a code mode as sort of the dominant mode. Oh, it's the wrong Karish paper. This is the Karish paper where he took Judy Young's observations and derived a, a H2 mass function. So the Karish paper is, is, is actually a data paper. Oh, so, okay, <laughs> um, yeah. So basically, you're saying still that smooth accretion is able to uh, count all properties when you observe and you guess. Our models don't have smooth accretion because our accre I mean, we follow in detail the, the dark matter ha halo merger but tree. So if the if no, 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 you basically do not allow for any sort of mixture of gas, sort of you know, that's created different epochs. You basically sort of build up the you know the higher energy field and that sort of also the halo that you know less than it. Well, I mean, when there are mergers of, of, of lumps, then, then the accretion rates go up to track it. Uh, and I'll show you a plot right now. Some of this scatter actually comes from um, lumpy accretion, the fact that there's scatter and accretion histories of, of, of galaxies. So this, this is what I'm trying to explain right now. So, so one, of, one of the things that drive scatter in these plots are the, are the the masses of the halos, the other one is, of course, the spin parameter, uh, which sets the contraction factor of the infalling gas. So higher spin parameter means you have larger galaxies with lower gas surface densities and higher atomic fractions with respect to molecular gas fractions. So that, that's all what you see here. So the higher the spin parameter, um, the lower the molecular fraction, the higher the gas fractions, and so on. And the final is that this is the issue of how much recent accretion there has been. So we've uh, parameterized that in terms of the fraction of the gas in the galaxy that was accreted recently. And by recently, we mean in the last giga year. So why would one galaxy have had more accretion than the other ones? That, that is a function of the stochasticity and the merging histories that we have in the simulation. So if one, if one, had a, if one was just you know, not growing very much and the other one had, had, had an infall of new gas. So in terms of what you, what you mean by smooth, or, well, I don't know what you mean by smooth. Oh, I mean smooth in the gas rather than sort of in dark matter, of course you have sort of smooth dark matter. But yeah. But you basically build up the sort of the gas inside out. And right. But we... You for sort of a density distribution within a dark matter halo that sort of, you know, then has a fraction of shock basically and, and so on. Yes, we do. I mean, but in, in, in practice, the... Uh, The average one looks like that, but if, uh, in terms of, uh, but you, the in the in the trees you get lots of, uh, uh, you know, lumps and merges, and whenever uh, whenever you get a jump in in the mass of the dark matter halo, then you get a jump in, in the cooling. That's that's what actually drives this. So I, I'm we're not tracking in detail, you know, the configuration in which it comes in, but the stochasticity. Uh, in, in the simulation itself is reflected in the histories. But this gas which is coming out late time, that's coming out at large radius. That's true. Large and spin parameter is basically already set. Well, the spin parameter has a range, of right. course, but yeah. uh, uh, but it, right. it, is, it is scaling with variable radius of the halo, which is great. So if you're talking about gas, which is falling into the yeah. inner part of this, to make a new start, that's not this gas. It, it does, uh, let me show you the observations. So <laughs> you may not believe this, but I, I believe this is what we are actually seeing in the observations. But, uh, um, okay. So the question one might ask, you know, the question that I have is, you know, is there some way of, when we do a survey, of identifying galaxies that have had recent gas accretion, because these are interesting galaxies, so when we look at these models, we are led to uh, the following conclusions. Um, the one is that uh, you would have to spend some time staring at the, the diagrams, but what you can see is that if galaxies have high gas surface densities and high total atomic and molecular gas content with respect to, to a mean, um, this is a pretty safe signature of a recent accretion event because the time scales over which the gas is consumed to stars is short and these are unambiguous. But if the galaxy has low gas surface densities and lower than average ratios of molecular 
to atomic gas. This could be a recent accretion event. This could be material which has come in to the outside of the galaxy, but it's not proof because some of these galaxies may have just had high spin parameters, so they created some gas, had lots of angular momentum, just sat there on the outside for a long time. Um, assuming that these disks remain stable, of course. So it's, it's, it's plausible, but not proof. So you have to look for additional signatures. And um, you might say, why do we care about identifying galaxies and surveys that have had recent accretion? Is because we want to understand these theoretical processes um, and what they actually look like in the real universe. So we can make these pictures and simulations, but I would argue that observers have not come up with any observational evidence for such processes occurring in the real universe so far. They've looked and failed. Okay, so this is what we've been doing. We, we have been using these mean relations defined in our survey, and now we're starting to look at the outliers. So let's, for example, this is an, one interesting galaxy um, that I can show you. It's, it's, uh, it lies in the gas-rich uh, part of the, uh, of the outlier uh, of the plane. This is the galaxy. We call it gas 3505. Um, it's a gas-rich red and dead galaxy. So it's morphology when you look at it in Sloan, uh, normal boring elliptical, stellar mass of, uh, it's not a very big one, it's a few times 10 to the 10 stellar masses. It's optical spectrum within the fiber, uh, boring, um, no, no, no star forming, you know, big 4,000 angstrom break, dead, red and dead. It has a huge booming H1 detection, implying a gas mass of uh, almost 10 to the 10, affecting H1 to stellar mass ratio of 44%. Um, clearly, no signs of star formation in, in, in the galaxy. If you look in the UV, there was this very faint low surface brightness ring-like feature. And then, very serendipitously, we found, on, thanks to the virtual observatory, we searched, and there was a deeper image. So Sloan, you know, the images are nice, but they're not very deep. This is a seven-minute KPNO um, wide filter uh, VR band exposure uh, of that galaxy, um, showing a clear uh, trail. Um, and we ask ourselves, you know, is one of these tidal features, could this be signature of a recent and falling satellite? So I was in Colombia and um, trying to convince some simulators that this is an interesting system that they should help us understand um, in more detail. If anybody here likes to do these things, please come and talk to me. But I was talking to Catherine Johnston and saying, what do you think of this? This is a very thin um, trail here. It's extending. 60 kiloparsecs, it's amazingly thin, um, and relatively high surface brightness. And she was telling me at least that it didn't look like, uh, so she's been doing these libraries of, of, of hot accretion of, of, of dispersion dominated um, hot systems. And she said, well, I don't get anything that looks like that. So we were speculating on whether you really need gas to keep things that thin. Moreover, it's, it recalls 10 to the 10, almost 10 to the 10 solar masses of gas, which has um, if it's associated with the satellite, it's we'd really needed to understand how it has not managed to form any stars. It's, it's in atomic form, but, but no apparent ongoing star formation. So there's two mysteries of the system which I would like, would throw out a challenge to perhaps some simulators who like to do this kind of thing. Um, the other thing we can do when we'd like to get more deeper imaging, and I think um, with pan stars and other wide angle surveys, it'll be very interesting to look for other signatures of, of, of infall, uh, direct signatures of infall of this kind. Um, another thing we're doing is to look uh, photometrically at our, our H1 rich uh, outliers. So studying the H1 rich galaxy population using a combination of Sloan and uh, resolved Sloan and UV photometry. So the majority, the majority of the H1 rich outliers are not this kind of object. They're not red and dead with huge gas fractions that are not, those are fairly rare cases. We have more of them, but they're, they're not, most of them are actually these kinds of things. So these are, this is a sort of a gallery of galaxies which um, 
have more than, they're Milky Way type masses, but they have more than 30% H1. Um, so you see they're blue, they have extended disks, um, blue outer regions. And that's just compared to a control sample of galaxies selected to be at the same redshift, at the same mass, but irrespective of H1, just to sh show you the difference. This is gas rich, yeah, sorry, gas rich, gas poor. So, um, so you can quantify that, what you see in the image. You just register and convolve the SDSS and GALAX images to the same resolution and, and look at, for example, um, color profiles and so on. So what we find is that uh, galaxies with higher H1 mass fractions are more actively forming stars in their outer regions. So this is a plot of the specific star formation rate uh, inside the half-light radius. Uh, just concentrate on the blue and the green lines as a function of H1 fraction. This is in the outer, uh, outside the half-light radius in the outer regions of the disk. So if you take the difference uh, between the two, you get an effective star formation gradient. So this is the difference between the outer and inner specific star formation rates. And you see that the, the more H1 rich the galaxy is, the more star formation that's occurring in the outer disk. And also galaxies with uh, higher H1 mass fractions are more asymmetric and clumpy. Um, you can get these from uh, morphological measures such as the asymmetry and smoothness parameter and so on. So we, we've started and um, a... It's nice to look at the photometric profiles, but um, the, the combination of long slit spectroscopy would give you additional uh, interesting physical information about what's going on in the outer disks of these galaxies. So we started this on the MMT um, to get, uh, to get um, slit spectroscopy across the face of the disk, particularly uh, in these outer regions. So here's an example of, a, of an H1 galaxy with blue I don't know if you can see very well, but it has a very blue outer region. And here's its rotation curve, uh, very normal looking rotation curve. And uh, this is actually metallicity. This is actually the metallicity profile of that galaxy. So what you see is that these points here are at, at about solar. So this line is, is solar metallicity. So in the inner regions, it's all consistent with solar. And then in the outer regions, just where you see the blue light, you get a drop, about a factor of three, in metallicity on both sides. So it seems as though this outer light is it's more, it's more strongly star forming and it's also metal poor. So it's all consistent with what you might expect for creating some amount of, of unenriched gas from the environment. So qualitatively, at least for the galaxies we've looked at so far, this picture of building up the outer disk seems qualitatively in agreement with observations. We have to build up statistics and we have to um, look at this in, in more detail to, to show that this is really quantitatively what is going on. So, what, so, so at what radius is the star formation that you see in these galaxies? Is it like 20 kilopascals? In this particular galaxy, um, that's, that's out at about, beyond about 10 kiloparsecs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And is there any molecular measurements? We, yeah, this one was included in our pilot program. Okay, so the, I showed you the one case of the, 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 the red and dead galaxy that wasn't forming any stars. Uh, yeah, we took, that was in our pilot program. We did not detect it in, in, in Iran. We did offsets. We, it was less than 10 to the 8 solar masses and molecular gas. This one uh, that where you see the drop in metallicity, it has a weak detection, and if but um, we'd, like to, we'd like to firm that up, but the, the canonical number, if we take the ratio of star formation that we see in the blue light to the, to the molecular gas detection that we do have, it, its ratio is about what you expect from the, uh, the standard conversion from, from Begil and Leroy and so on. Okay, so is that the way, so I can, you can ask the question, so is that how galaxies get their gas? Do they just accrete uh, H1-rich satellites, and, um, and is that the end of the story? Um, and I will argue that that's not the end of the story, that maybe H1-rich satellites have something to do with it, but they cannot be the reservoir which is bringing in most of the ga gas to feed you know, the, these, these star-forming uh, galaxies at the present day. And that comes from, uh, from 
the only way to do that is to look statistically at uh, satellites um, uh, around large samples of, of star-forming galaxies in Sloan. Um, and in this case, you don't observe the gas directly, but what you can do is that because you have uh, information from the colors uh, of the satellites in Sloan, we have five-band photometry, and you know something about its structure, then you can use statistical scaling relations between color and, and H1 fraction, and um, you, can, you can statistically look at, as a function of radius, uh, around star-forming galaxies, uh, you can look at you know, how much mass, stellar mass is contained in satellites and how much gas is contained in satellites uh, as a function of, uh, of projected radius, so, and also corrected for foreground background contamination. So we've built up these, these, both these stellar mass and um, gas mass, uh, so the red is the stellar mass, and the blue is the uh, gas mass uh, integrated profiles. Uh, and these are restricted to isolated galaxies, so we're not worried about galaxies and clusters and so on. And then what you need after you know how much galaxies are in satellites as a function of projected distance, then you need to know how long it takes uh, before that, those galaxies merge, uh, and that will then convert into a gas accretion rate. So we've used the Kitzbichler and White calibration of merging times as a function of mass and projected radius using the Millennium simulation. And so then we can convert our, our profiles uh, and using those times into basically a, uh, uh, a gas accretion rate and we can ask what fraction, and this is what shows the fraction of the st observed star formation that can be accounted for by, by the accretion of the gas. So what we find is that the rate at which gas associated with satellites reaches the central galaxies uh, falls short of what is needed to explain its star formation by, by a large factor. It's a factor of 30 to 100. So it fails. Well, in your mercury trees, where are most of the barriers? I mean, you put barriers in the hills in a way that more or less fits empirical stellar you know, loss of dispersion relations. OK. So this is, the uh, this is the danger of mixing up theory with observations in the same talk. So this, this, is, a, this, is, this is all observations. Um, so there are no trees here. Um, so this is just based on counting satellites in the SDSS survey, assigning a gas, and saying how much gas is there. In our merger, tr well, okay, in our merger trees, the baryons are, there is this, most of the baryons have not condensed into galaxies. We know that already just from taking, you know, what we know is the observed baryon fraction from cosmology uh, and uh, knowing what, what, what stellar mass function of the universe is today, most of it cannot be in, in galaxies. Okay, uh, so... Much, sorry, how much room is there to put more gas in the satellites? Is there any to solve it that way? Well, the, the, these satellites go down to R band magnitudes of 21. So we've, we've gone, um, so we stopped at 17. I th and we're, so we're going, we're going more than a factor of 10. We're going four magnitudes below the, the primary. So we're getting most of, the, most of the satellites. And I know we don't believe that it could be uh, so we're making sure that we see all the satellites down, down to four magnitudes below the primary. Okay, but what is interesting is that even though the gas carried by the satellites is not sufficient to account for the observed star formation, um, we do in Sloan, this is Sloan data now, see a clear signal for blue galaxies to have more gas in the surroundings. So what I've done here is on the top, I've split the galaxies in different bins of stellar mass into the red population um, and the blue population, pretty much along the bimodal. Uh, and then I plot the integrated mass, stellar mass in satellites uh, for the blue and the red populations, and the integrated gas mass in satellites for the blue and the red populations. So you see that there's no real effect in how much mass, stellar mass is carried by the satellites, but the blue galaxies have more gas in satellites in their surroundings. Now, if you don't believe me, there's an effect which Fun and Bosch uh, have found already in the Sloan. They call that galactic conformity. They said that if a galaxy is blue, its satellites are more likely to be blue. If its galaxy is red, 
satellites are more likely to be red. And they speculated on things going the other way around, that, that the host galaxy was somehow affecting uh, the colors of its satellites. I would argue that this is, it's going the other way around. This is a consequence of fueling. What we see this is when we convert to gas fractions, that we see this correlation. And then we can, we can break it up further, um, you know, not just dividing into red and blue, but defining, dividing into, into color bins. And what we find is a uh, strong and continuous correlation between the color of the galaxy and the amount of gas contained in its environments and scales of a few hundred kiloparsecs. And we can also show that this correlation is primarily with a star formation and not with any other parameter of the galaxies. Because you have to be careful because star formation and other properties go together, so you have to make sure that this correlation, uh, the primary driver is really star formation, and we've done that check. Okay, so getting to the end of my talk. So the question is, we've shown that the gas carried by the satellites cannot be fueling the galaxy, full short by orders of magnitude. But why should the star formation the galaxy know about the gas and satellites that has not yet reached the galaxy? These are things out to scales of, the, uh, of 100 kiloparsecs. So my current guess is the only thing that makes sense to me is that the satellites are simply tracers of a larger supply. So we're seeing like um, icebergs in a sea. Uh, ionize that. So these, these satellites could be regions of, of atomic gas tracing in a larger underlying supply, uh, supply of ionized gas and filaments. And, um, and the satellites do accrete, but so does the ionized gas. And maybe that is what fuels, um, what fuels the ongoing star formation in the disk. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. OK, so we'll come to the summary. Uh, so we are in the process of trying to build complete samples of galaxies selected only by stellar mass uh, for which we have H1 measurements down to limiting gas fractions of a few percent. These samples will allow us to define mean scaling relations between gas, stellar mass, and other structural parameters. Um, once you've defined the mean scaling relations, it's interesting to examine these outliers. So we found unusually gas-rich galaxies in two kinds of varieties. Um, so galaxies with strong color gradients with enhanced star formation occurring in clumps or spiral arms in the outer disk. These are these blue, very blue uh, outer disk galaxies. And ga also galaxies that are early type. If these are much rarer. So, and, um, so they're early type. They don't have much star formation. They have a lot of gas. Um, one thing you could ask, are they connected? Is, this an early, is B really an earlier stage of A? Um, so, as I said, we found evidence for a recent accretion event around one of these very red H1-rich galaxies through this tidal stream, um, leading us to speculate that these objects may be accreting new gas before trans transitioning back to the blue sequence. Statistically, however, um, there's not enough neutral gas associated with optically identified galaxies to maintain the observed rates of star formation in spiral galaxies like our own Milky Way. So we postulate that there must be an unseen reservoir of ionized gas uh, that's traced by the satellites, perhaps in the form of filaments. And this would explain why the star formation rates of galaxies are strongly correlated with the mass of the gas in their satellites, even though the satellites themselves can't be responsible for the fueling. And we're also interested in future in these unusually gas-poor galaxies, and we hope that they can con constrain quenching mechanisms, um, but will require more work, larger samples, and so on. So thank you. Um, I guess it's related to the question of how many satellites there are relative to Well, I, we haven't done the exercise in, 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 in the models, but I suspect the answer is probably yes, because of the, cause the, the models do re reproduce the other constraints that we have. They have to reproduce the mass function. They reproduce 
roughly the gas mass, stellar mass scalings, and then they reproduce the clustering, and those things together should, should add to the same thing. Oh, we wish we could. Uh, what, what I really want is uh, zillions of uh, <laughs> cause spectra of infinitely faint quasars to act as sight lines. Uh, yeah. Um, unfortunately, I learned that every cause, every quasar will, will be able to get cause data for was known uh, was known before Sloan came along. And it's still a still significantly limited to the very brightest quasars. So the number of, uh, of targets, possible targets that we have behind our galaxies is very, very small. Um, it's, it's, it, it's very hard to see this gas. I mean, um, absorption lines are probably the best, the best way to go in the longer term. Okay, it was surprisingly hard, but I guess after the fact, um, you go back to Krumholtz and Boots and Rosalowski papers, and they, are, they kind of tune up their models so that they reproduce the same data. So it's not um, particularly in the surprising that in the mean, uh, for the mean Milky Way type galaxy, the two prescriptions give almost identical results. Uh, where they differ is in terms of uh, outliers. So uh, in particular, uh, let me come back to this point. So one thing, the best way to see this is to look at this plot, which shows this one. So there's the uh, Krumholtz model is extremely heavily thresholded uh, as a function of metallicity. It's big scatter between uh, galaxies of different metallicity at low surface densities. So that leads to different predictions in outer disks, and also leads to different predictions for low surface density, uh, low metallicity galaxies. Um, in terms of these higher galaxies, the scaling relations have more scatter. Uh, for, for Krumholtz, just because of this behavior is much more extreme than this behavior. So if you have scatter and metallicity among your galaxy populations, um, you will get scatter in the scaling relations arising from here from this. And if you can make, and the test we propose is that we can get, we can actually measure the gas phase metallicity in, in our survey by, by these long slit spectra. And in this case, you should see stratification. So say you have galaxy of fixed surface density of gas, and the, the more metal rich ones you should see have higher H2 fractions, if Krumholtz is correct, because the metallicity is a very strong second order parameter in his scaling. And the splits in Rosalowski metallicity doesn't come in at all, so you shouldn't see that. Just because it's a, it's a constant background reading, it seems as though that would be at least as good as that. Uh, I mean, first order of that would be kind Yes, well actually, um, it, it drops, it, it's kind of, it drops out of his calculation. So it's a kind of a conspiracy uh, in, in, in that the, in that in, it probably breaks down in the outer regions and the diffuse regions of disk where the radi outer radiation field does matter. But in the inner high density region, um, the way it works between assuming this pressure balance uh, and, and the radiation field is that it actually drops out. So that the, this, the, these are the only two variables that matter in the end. So it's one of the neat things that he predicted. Any other questions? Okay, then we'll have